thank you for coming tonight uh, to talk about uh, the opioid epidemic that is going on across our country. My name is Dr. Michael Newpuff. I'm a doctor of internal medicine and the medical director at Farnham Family Services here in Oswego. I'd like to introduce my two colleagues who are going to be talking with us tonight. Uh, on this side is Dr. Jamie Syrett, who's an emergency room doctor. Uh, he's not just an emergency room doctor. He is one of the best ER doctors that I've had an opportunity to work with. And the thing that makes Dr. Syrett so good is that he does two things that most don't. He knows how to take a history and he listens to people. And that's what separates him from most other ER doctors. On my other side is Mr. Mark Raymond, who's uh, trained in counseling. He has 20 years of experience in substance abuse disorders. He is the coordinator for the new opioid treatment program at Farnham Family Services. So what we're going to do is we'd like this to be a very informal and informative discussion tonight. So if we're not going to have PowerPoints, we're not going to have bullet points. If anybody has any questions, and we hope there'll be lots of them, uh, please let us know at any time. I'm going to start out the discussion talking about what research has shown us in the last 10 years what is actually causing addiction to opioids. And so that's my first discussion. And we'll talk for 10 or 15 minutes each, and then we'll open it up for questions. Dr. Syrett's going to tell us what it's like on the front lines, what he's seen over his experience working in the emergency room, and the types of patients that he's seeing. And Mark's going to then talk to us about what an opioid treatment program really means, what it's been doing in Oswego, uh, and the future for it. So let me go ahead and get started with my topic, why people get addicted. Um, I'm going to start with a case study. And because of strict confidentiality rules, I cannot tell you the name of the individual. But see if you have an idea who it might be. Uh, this is a 68-year-old supposedly retired doctor who really likes potato chips. Now, this individual, whenever he goes into a grocery store, is immediately drawn to the snack line counters. Okay? The left side of his brain says, forget about it. Don't even think about it. That's bad for you. Cholesterol, salt, calories. Don't even think about it. However, there's a side of this brain that's called the pleasure response center that says, you know, don't listen to him. You remember what those potato chips tasted like, don't you, and how good they tasted. Don't worry about it. Just buy a little bag. Well, OK, that physician is me. And most of the time, I can go past the counter and not worry about it. But occasionally, I'll break down and either buy a small bag, or if I'm really good, I'll buy the baked potato chips. OK, now, we all have something like this in our brains. It's been termed the pleasure response center. And we all have it. It's something that we're born with. Different people react in different ways to this response center. Some people like chocolate, for example. My wife's is that first cup of coffee in the morning. She knows how good that first cup of coffee can be. Whether it's listening to music, whether it's taking a walk in a park, or more destructive activities like gambling, or alcohol, or workaholic. Something stimulates that part of the brain that it produces an enjoyment for us. And we call that the pleasure response center. Now, in the people I've spoken with who have attended Farnham, imagine something that produces 30 to 50 times the enjoyment that most of us experience from other things. 30 to 50 times the stimulus. And that's what they say heroin is like. How does it start, though? People don't just start on heroin. In the old days, 
It used to be crack cocaine in the big cities, crack cocaine, an addiction to heroin. But it's different nowadays, and I'll tell you what the difference really is. Nine out of ten people that we have seen that I interview say that they tried prescription pills in their teenage years. Why is it such a problem? It's been called an epidemic, even though you can't catch it from somebody. It is a crisis, and it's been labeled a national crisis. In 2016, over 30,000 people died from opioid overdoses in our country alone. It's the biggest cause of death in the 20 to 40 age group. More people died from opioid overdoses than auto accidents or gunshots in our country. And it continues to be a problem. And it's not just New York or Syracuse or Detroit or Chicago. It's Oswego. It's Auburn. It's Geneva. It's Watertown. How did it get like this? How did it happen? Okay, so imagine some people were prescribed opiates because of injuries, because of pain, but the people that I've seen so far, nine out of ten as teenagers, tried them for a, a lark because they wanted to try something. The first thing felt, the first time they took that opiate, they said, ooh, I like that. Stimulated that pleasure center. I like that. And the next thing they say is, you know, I want to do that again because I enjoyed that. I want it. And after a few times, it doesn't take a lot for some people, and that's what I'll mention next, it doesn't take a lot of time to go from like to want to need. And that is a quick term that we call dependency. Okay, so let's drop back just a minute and say, what are these opiates that everybody's talking about? Well, as the name comes from, they are chemical compounds that are similar to opium. And opium is a direct extraction from a particular kind of poppy plant. That little bulbous object after the leaves fall out at the bottom, that's where opium is. Now, before you run out to Ontario orchards and start buying poppies to grow in your backyard to supplement your retirement accounts, those are illegal. There's a particular kind, and they're illegal in this country, and you can't grow them, only certain places. But that's the original Chinese opium den, Sherlock Holmes opium. If you extract opium and you process it, that's how you get heroin from opium to heroin. Morphine is an additional extraction from heroin and was used as a pain reliever and also to help those people who are addicted to heroin. Imagine, morphine just as addicting being used to get people off heroin. After that time, methadone, again a chemical compound similar to heroin and morphine, was created to try to help those people get off morphine addiction. Pharmaceutical companies then developed multiple different combinations of those. Hydrocodone, oxycodone, oral morphine preparations. And virtually all the people that we see get their start, so to speak, from oxycodone. And if I had one wish, it would be to take that drug off of the market, because that's seemingly what happens to many people. Okay, so why do people start? Why they're all told, don't take drugs. I mean, we all hear that in school, don't take drugs, but they do. They try them, they like, they want, and then becomes neat. We changed the equation, though, a few years ago, because at one time, opiate pills, particularly oxycodone, was just everywhere. But New York 
being a little ahead of the curve made it much more difficult to get opioid prescription pills. And in a way, we pushed those people who were already dependent on opioid prescriptions into heroin because heroin was much easier to get, actually less expensive on the street than opioid pills were. And virtually all the people that we're seeing now in our opioid treatment program are on heroin. And they've been on heroin for anywhere from three years to as many as seven years. And it's not even that these people want the drug anymore. They don't get high from it. They take it because they need it. It has become a dependent part of their body. Now, at Farnham, we think of opioid dependency as no different than an individual who has a medical condition that requires treatment. In my mind, what's the difference if somebody's a diabetic and they need insulin to maintain their lives? We don't think that's so bad. I can't cure diabetes, but I can maintain their health and their lives by treatment with medications. The same thing with high blood pressure. The same thing with arthritis. I can't cure any of those diseases, but I can maintain them on treatment. We think of opioid treatment as the same type condition. It's a chronic medical problem that can be treated. Now, how do we know, for example, that this, there's a part of the brain that becomes stimulated and is causing the cravings. Well, here's an interesting little research. There's a type of white lab rat called an R2 rat that becomes very easily addicted, dependent on opiates. What they did for research, they used a radioactive type of morphine, they injected in the rat, they then scanned the brain, and they found that part of the brain that took up the morphine in what we call receptors. Those people, those rats that had receptors got addicted to morphine very quickly. So what they did was they took a laser beam and they destroyed that part of the brain, right? They res destroyed the receptors. And interestingly, those rats were cured from their opioid dependency. They no longer needed opioids. Unfortunately, they became compulsive eaters and were sexually aggressive but the point is, these horny, fat mice were no longer opioid addicted. We know there's a part of the brain that is receptor, that has receptors for opiates. And once they are activated, they remain activated. They have shown that brain scans of people who are on opiates have a part of their brain with this accelerated process. It becomes part of their brain. And so it's not simply that people can just stop heroin. Why can't you stop being a junkie? It's because their brain has been rewired. And until we learn how to change that rewiring, it's not a matter of cure, it's a matter of treatment. So that's my pitch of how people get addicted. What I'd like to do now is introduce Dr. Syrett to tell you what it's like on the front lines in the ER. Thanks, Mike. I'll stay seated, because when I stand up, I walk around, and then people feel like class. So, so I'm, uh, I'm heading up to Oswego Hospital tonight to do a 12-hour shift. Looking around the room, there's probably about, I don't know, maybe 50 people here, roughly 40, 50 people. I'll probably see or be responsible for about 40 people. And I would say that one or two of them will have overdosed on narcotics, whether it's heroin or fentanyl. Um, they'll stop breathing. And uh, if they're lucky, someone around them will uh, be able to pick up the phone, call 911, get the ambulance there, and uh, get them to hospital. If uh, probably about once or twice a week, I'll, uh, that person doesn't make it for whatever reason. They'll be brought to the hospital. They'll have stopped breathing. 
their hearts stop, they're dead. And then I'll spend the next half an hour, 45 minutes talking to their mom and dad about what happened. Now, if I go back 22 years when I started in the emergency room, um, the, uh, we were probably part of the problem. If you came in and you had pain, um, you got painkillers. And that was reinforced when uh, the, the, your level of pain became a vital sign. And then we, we were held in the emergency room to addressing pain. If someone comes in, it doesn't matter what pain they have, what pain, they, what pain level they say they have, um, that's the pain level you treat. So I'd see people that had broken their femur, and they, they would say their pain's 2 out of 10. And I'd say, boy, that, that looks like a pretty painful injury. And then I'd see someone with a strep throat or a twisted ankle, and they would say, we'd say, what's your pain? One, is, zero is, the, is no pain, and 10 is the worst pain they ever had. And they would say, typically they would say, it's 100. <laughs> and we'd say, give us a number between zero and 10. And they'd say, it's a 10. And if it was a 10, um, I'd have to give them narcotics. And I'd have to show that their pain level came down. Now, um, then when they, they'd go home, I'd, I'd prescribe painkillers because it's still sore. They want something for pain. Um, I would uh, probably give them a week's supply of painkillers, and I'd send them on their way. 60% uh, of my patients would get painkillers when they left the emergency room. Invariably, that painkiller would be oxycodone. Sorry. <laughs> so then uh, we realized this was a problem. Uh, we were seeing more and more people that were coming in looking for painkillers. The emergency room became a conduit where you could make up a story, get your painkillers, and move on. And we used to have people that would go from ER to ER to ER um, that, uh, that would collect pills. And um, I actually remember I was driving to one of my hospitals I worked at, and I stopped off. It was the middle of summer. I stopped off for an ice cream. And there was two people in front of me. I, I knew both of them because I'd seen them as patients. They were having a conversation. And one said, what do you plan on doing tonight? And I said, well, I was thinking about going to the emergency room to get some painkillers. And then they turned around and they caught me, my blue scrubs in the corner of their eye. And they said, but I'm not going <laughs> to go to the ER that he works at. So, but that was, that was their life. And um, they may know that they're addicted. They probably didn't. But this was just part of their, their life. Nowadays, New York State stepped in. We have a big computer system. They're very aggressive about um, physicians that overprescribe painkillers. And they got the physicians running scared. If I write one or two prescriptions for painkillers tonight, um, that, that would be a lot. I'll probably still give narcotics in the emergency room for people that have pain. But I have a lot more tools to to um, uh, address people's pain. We have different medications, and uh, those medications are maybe not quite as addictive as some of the medications that we used to use. Some of the medications way back when, if you gave them after their second dose, you could actually detect signs of addiction, which I think is just incredible, that all it would take is one or two doses in the emergency room, and your brain physiology would change to the point that you started the process of addiction. So we all thought this was great. New York State's clamping down. They're going to tell us people are not going to come to the emergency room anymore for painkillers. This is going to be great. The problem was all the other physicians that were prescribing painkillers were stopped as well. And there was a vacuum created. And whenever there's a vacuum, there's a business opportunity. And the drug dealers said, hey, this is great. We've got all these patients that are looking for oxycodone. They can't get it. But boy, heroin's cheap today. And actually today, I think heroin's actually cheaper than oxycodone on the street. And then they started taking uh, heroin. And then the dealers really wanted to get them hooked in. So they, uh, they added fentanyl, which is 100 times the strength of heroin. 
And that's probably one of the problems because people were expecting heroin and they got fentanyl and they, they got hit with 100 times the dose they expected. So I've been, one of the jobs that I do is I, I'm Rochester based and I review cardiac arrest data for uh, the city of Rochester. And uh, in that, even 10 years ago, the cardiac arrest, the average age of cardiac arrest was probably 80, 75. Today, if I see a cardiac arrest at, of a 75 year old, it's unusual. Because today the cardiac arrests are all 22, 24, 28, 30. I'm, I'm coming on 45 now and uh, I do cardiac arrest review where every single one of the people is uh, younger than me. Which is, and it's almost always because of drug overdose. In fact, it's got to a point that if, if the paramedics go out to the scene, they bring a cardiac arrest in and they say on the radio, we're bringing in someone that's 25. We just assume it was a, a heroin overdose and just another one. So we've swung the pendulum back and forward in the emergency room. I think probably at the beginning of my career, we were part of the problem. Um, we, we are hopefully part of the solution. Um, although we may be increasing the problem by forcing patients to other drugs, and for a long time there was no other options. Um, but we're, we've, we've been witness to it through all the time. But life has changed uh, once or twice a week. As I say, I'm walking into the quiet room, the meditation room, to tell someone that their kid died. So that's where I'm at. Thank you, Jamie. Any questions so far from anybody? Yes, ma'am. You say you detect this in the brain and activate it. If they stay off drugs for years, does it ever reverse? The, the relapse rate we know is as high as 90%. So yes, some people get off and can stay off. But the craving is very difficult. And it appears that activation produced by these receptors lasts for perhaps forever. Mark, any comments about that so far? I mean, I would say, you know, the, you guys spoke a lot about this. There, there really is no proof that the brain chemistry heals. And you guys were both speaking of the brain, and this goes all the way back to like the 1960s with the Dole and Neiswander studies, the consensus studies, where they found these changes in the brain for the opioid addicted person. And you know, to keep it, like some people don't understand, it's like there's a withdrawal. When the opioid addicted person goes into withdrawal, there's that acute withdrawal. They feel very sick and that's where they're really likely to jump into uh, drug seeking behaviors because as soon as they use an opiate, that alleviates that withdrawal. And that withdrawal is like flu-like. It's, you know, it could be diarrhea, it could be high fever, uh, really, really sick. And if it's not already understood, heroin, can take that withdrawal away just like those oxycotons could, oxycodone and fentanyl. And that's why people, so maybe people who didn't even use fentanyl before or heroin before, if it could take that withdrawal away to allow them to function, then they might do these things like they do fentanyl or heroin like they wouldn't have done before. But then people think, okay, you've gotten through this, post, this acute withdrawal, so now they're gonna be fine. But there's also something called post-acute withdrawal and the issue that we don't know that the brain chemistry has been healed. Post-acute withdrawal, the person could still feel lethargic, cravings, sensitivity to pain, um, depression-like symptoms, and it's a high rate, uh, a high risk for relapse. And there's, you know, they may not feel good unless they use an opiate again. So I would say there's no proof that the brain chemistry heals. Yes, there are some people that can get off of uh, opioids and be successful, but a high rate of them will relapse. And then with that period of abstinence, they become a high risk of a fatal overdose because if they haven't used for a significant period of time and then they do relapse, their tolerance has gone down. So if they use even, you know, if they use a similar amount, that could be enough to put them uh, into a fatal overdose. I mean, that's what I would add. I think I, I would add that the brain's constantly changing as we mature and um, there's a lot of good evidence now that the teenager, late teen, up until about 
the age of 26, the brain is still developing. And during that time, that group is even more at risk of addiction with uh, narcotics, that changing brain. So it happens in all age groups, but the at-risk age group is very much that same group that's leaving home, finding their way, uh, finding their own way in their, their life. And I gotta tell you, I cringe at the thought of prescribing codeine, Percocet, Vicodin to someone that's 19 or 20 that um, uh, broke their ankle playing, playing soccer at the university. Because I know that they've got pain, but I also know that by prescribing narcotics, I could actually, in the short term, be doing them a positive thing by reducing their pain, but in the long term, be making them at more at risk for um, long-term addiction. So is there, is there has to be research, is it anything promising just to cure, just addict, or at least mitigate addiction, period? Are they all related? You see what I'm getting at? In many ways, they are related. Um, if you look at, there was a National Geographic magazine out about six months ago that talked about this, the uh, addiction crisis, what's causing addiction, and what's being done in research-wise to permanently cure these addiction problems. And yes, there is some research being done. There's some interesting things with electromagnetic waves that they're doing to try to change the chemistry of the brain, trying to reduce this receptor overactivation is really what it is. At the moment, there is nothing that we know of really works, but there's lots of research being done about it. How do we help the addicts? Good place to start. Let me introduce uh, Mark Raymond, who is again the uh, director of the opioid treatment program in Oswego. Mark, as I said, has 20 years experience in substance abuse. He has been my mentor and teacher. Uh, I never would have been able to learn as much about opioid treatment and abuse without Mark helping me. So it, he, he's, been, he's been a great resource and a great colleague, and I'll turn the podium over to him at this point. Thank you very much. I mean, that's a huge compliment, so thank you. It's an honor to be here, too, and I appreciate you all being here. I just kind of like go back a little bit. You were talking a little bit about statistics. I attended a meeting in Albany last week about um, the governor's approach towards uh, you know, his five-point plan, which also included some information about the opioid epidemic. And they threw out a few more statistics. You know, in 2010, 1,000 people died of opioid overdoses in New York State. 2016, that was 3,000 people. Um, he talked about the average life expectancy of Americans. And for the second year, average life expectancy has actually gone down and they said if it happens again, one more time in 2017, I believe, that that would be the first time since in like 100 years. And it's directly related towards this opioid epidemic because of all of these overdoses, people dying at very young ages. So the problem, as you know, is real. Um, and, and let me keep looking. So in terms of treating the opioid addiction, you know, there's more than one way. There are drug-free programs, medication-free programs. You know, when you talk about 90% relapse rate, that does mean 10% succeed um, through you know, non-medication assisted treatment programs. But what we know is for, through years and years, the people that are most successful are actually taking, they're actually on medication assisted treatment programs. And for many years, um, there was only a program in Syracuse. And so people were traveling from 15, 16, maybe 17 counties just to get to Syracuse to receive these services, which I'll talk about just a little bit in a minute. People were coming from Oswego every day, having to go from Oswego every day to receive services that could keep them from that acute and post-acute withdrawal that I was describing earlier. Imagine having to go somewhere every single day to start your treatment. Um, so it's really good that, and this is not a plug, it's really good that Farnham, uh, their leadership, their board wanted to bring the services to Oswego County, so because there's people dying here in Oswego too. And so to start bringing people here to Oswego, bring a program here to Oswego was a great idea. Um, I'd like to just share a little something about an opioid treatment program. You know, I did work uh, with one for a very long time in Syracuse. And in 2016, in Onondaga County, 
there were about 135 fatal overdoses. Onondaga County alone, that's a lot. In that same year where I worked, we treated about 1,000 patients. About 1,000 patients if you count the current census, admissions, and discharges. Anybody want to take a guess at how many people died on that program and all of those people had the same opioid substance use disorder that we're talking about? None. Now I can't promise that that's going to happen on every opioid treatment program because it is a risky population. But why did none die? Because the treatment works. And there's so much stigma about these types of treatment that I really hope that we can overcome that. And I think the people in this room, the fact that you're here alone, probably speaks that you're probably not the people with the negative stigma. Um, but the opioid treatment program works for a few reasons. So our opioid treatment program, like what most opioid treatment programs ought to have, is it's a medication, and we currently use methadone. You can also use buprenorphine, uh, suboxone, sabutex. But it's not just medication, it's medication plus the wraparound services. Those wraparound services include counseling, a doctor, and, you know, and we're very lucky, Dr. Newpuff sees every single patient for a physical, um, an induction, he sees them, and we come up with a treatment plan. Each patient is assigned a therapist, we do a thorough assessment, we develop treatment plans, and we try to treat the whole individual um, and help them get all of their needs met, in whether it's housing, address legal, medical, mental health, um, because it's not just about the medication or the physiological pieces of the addiction. But that is huge. To address that brain chemistry issue that's been talked about, that medication is a huge help. And methadone, methadone is a opioid, but methadone is a longer acting opiate. And it's, um, when prescribed properly and taken properly, the patient's not getting high off of it. They're not getting intoxicated off it but it will also alleviate their withdrawal and it will keep them from feeling sick. It can serve as a blockade and keep other opiates from having a full effect on them, if any effect at all. And it can uh, reduce cravings. So if a person's on a therapeutic dose of methadone or buprenorphine, suboxone, and getting proper wraparound services, they're not getting high, they're not intoxicated, but they're also not in withdrawal and they're not sick. And that allows them to function and work on those goals of their treatment plan. And what we have seen, and studies show, Research shows that this medication-assisted formula reduces fatalities. It reduces the spread of infectious disease. It reduces criminal activity. It reduces a lot of negative stuff. <laughs> it improves people's ability to function as mothers, as fathers, as brothers, as students, as workers. Um, it improves the, their ability to take care of their health. And this isn't just to try to sell medication-assisted therapy. This is the facts. Um, so, I mean, we, that's as far as the opioid treatment program itself. It's, if, if we can't meet a need in the opioid treatment program, we do referrals to other additional services, um, whether it's outpatient. I'm sorry, you raised your hand. I, I was wondering what the protocol was for transitioning, um, transitioning people from a Suboxone to a methadone program. You, you do have to be careful because Suboxone has an antagonist to methadone. So that if you're trying to transition from Suboxone, which is a combination of two medicines, one that it's an opioid, what we call agonist, that works similarly to an opioid, but it also has an antagonist, which is why they put it in there to prevent people from injecting it. If you inject it, you automatically go through a type of withdrawal process. If you take it under your tongue, that antagonist part of it is destroyed by your stomach. So the idea is to prevent people from using it intravenously. The way we try to transition people is we taper the dose down. Once they are under eight milligrams, which is the dose of the buprenorphine, they have to be off of the drug for at least 48 hours. If they're off for 48 hours, then they can start the methadone. Okay. Going the other way from methadone to suboxone is much more difficult because then they have to be tapered down off methadone and off of that before they can start buprenorphine. Okay. But we found it to be safe if you taper it down to less than eight milligrams and then off for 48 hours. Say somebody who has been in recovery for a while and um, you know they go to the emergency room, is there anything in place where you can actually find out if they are a recovering addict? So yes, I, 
The, uh, the state now, every time you write a prescription for um, any form of narcotic, um, it, there's a process where it gets scanned into a system and that gets computerized and that, that um, prescription is listed under the person's names. And in some cases, you can go to that computer, type in their name, and get their prescription history for, for prescriptions they've filled. And so that often will give um, an idea to the ER physician what's going on. Because if you see 15, 15 months of Suboxone prescriptions, or, um, or then you're going, you're going to make your decisions one way. And if you see every other day narcotic prescriptions by a different doctor, and you're going to have different suspicions based right. the other. So there is, there is a way. Um, I think, uh, so I remember the time when there was only a Syracuse program. Mm -hmm. If you came to the emergency room and you were in narcotic withdrawal, we treated the symptoms, kind of buffed you up a little bit, make you, made you, your vital signs look a little bit better, gave you a sheet of paper with some phone numbers on it mm -hmm. and said, it's over to you. And I would think that the, the success rate of that plan is probably zero. Mm -hmm. I think now there's far more programs available. And the fact that we've got one locally, um, you, you know, we've been, we are, even tonight we were having discussions about how we can strengthen the link between the emergency room and Farnham to guarantee these patients get in there. Because I think we all recognize um, that that there's different motivations, there's different social pressures on the, on, on the patients that we're talking about. Um, there's time and cost commitments. There's family life. Um, there's just life in general. And um, we need to figure out a system where um, they're autonomous, they can make their own decisions, but the system is strengthened so that they can get to the resources that they need to start the process of recovery. And I think that we're only recently seeing that with the opening of programs like this locally. Um, so we're still, I think that's still happening. So I think it's a whole lot better than it was last yeah, year or the year before. And I would say that I'm, uh, while I live in Rochester, I work at Oswego Hospital. So oh, I'm an Oswego okay. Hospital right. doctor, yep. Okay. It's a complicated issue. You know, because if there were a way to see everybody's history for being treated with addiction, mm -hmm. they may walk into that ER in, or doctor's office and be undertreated. Pain is a very real issue too. Medical conditions are very real. Addiction is very real. So it is complicated when we start talking about having ways of knowing a person's history of treatment. Imagine if they really are there for a legitimate reason but have a history of addiction and then they get treated like an addict and rather than a person who needs, right. so it's complicated. One of the things that we also try doing in, you know, whether it's in an opioid treatment program or any other treatment, I hope, is to start treating patient teaching and coaching person accountability. You know, if that patient goes in, you know, we can't make anyone seek our help, we can't make anyone be committed to recovery, mm -hmm. but if somebody can go in and we have this type of education and we're sharing this education and prevention, and if people will go in and not just take that prescription of opiates, but say, hey, you know, I've had a history of some opioid addiction. I'd like the least amount of pain medication that you think I need for this, even if I have to come back in a couple days if it didn't work. So there's, it's, it's difficult, and you might think it's wishful thinking, but if we can just teach patient and person responsibility along with treatment, responsible doctor prescribing, you know, that might help as well. Uh, people have to be on board with keeping themselves safe as well is what I'm trying to say. I would say that we do have a lot more alternative options for, for pain control. Um, and I think that now there's a need because we're moving away from narcotic treatment for pain. Um, every day there's, there's new treatments coming out. I think we just recently got intravenous Tylenol, which is a brand new um, medication for us. Mm. And um, people always used to write off Tylenol and ibuprofen as painkillers. They're actually pretty good painkillers. Um, and the other interesting thing is I've, I've seen a trend in people that they don't want narcotics anymore. 
they just don't want them. And um, they say they make them feel doped up and, and whacked out, and there's various descriptions of it. Um, so I, I think we, we have a lot more options than, than we did. And every day, there's new drugs, and there's new suggestions on how to use old drugs. But just like everything else, it was a quick fix. If someone had pain, give them some opiates, and the pain would go away, problem solved. But now I think it's a discussion uh, with the patient and the doctor in the ER about where we're going with this. Thank you. And it's getting, it's getting harder now to go somewhere and have that pharmacy in Idaho or Wyoming give me my opioids. And you say, you know, you don't want any more oxycodone, which is like, a, in, in a sense, a death sentence for people like me. We're not the problem. But nobody ever thinks about what's going to happen to us if, if you all drop oxycodone. If I can address that, I certainly understand your predicament. Because when I was in private practice, I had patients who had chronic pain. And people with chronic pain need treatment. And we're not saying that people with chronic pain who are dependent on opioids shouldn't get them. There is a difference between abuse and dependency. There are individuals like yourself who have chronic pain and need treatment long term. And if they are dependent on opiates for control, that is acceptable. It's, we're not saying that that is bad medicine. Mm -hmm. What we're saying is that if it leads to abuse, where people abuse their medicine, instead of taking four oxycodone a day for control, they're taking six, eight, 12, 14, then on to heroin. I understand your concern because this is a balance, and Dr. Sarad has talked about this. We perhaps overprescribed opiates years ago because we were being pushed to control pain as a, the fourth vital sign. There are individuals like yourself, and I had s several in my practice who were on chronic pain treatment, and there's nothing wrong with that. Exactly. There's no difference than you having diabetes or high blood pressure. You have a medical condition. You're on treatment that allows you to function. You do not abuse your medicine, and that's the key. Can I add something? Please. What I would ask is, you know, because I do believe there's people out there exactly the way you're describing. I mean, for you to come out and say it the way you did and or as articulate as you did, I believe you. And at the same time, we do know that this problem really is huge and there are, you know, tens of thousands of people dying, something like 100 a day. Yeah, I, I so I guess what I would ask those folks, two things, those folks that are being super responsible and they're being adversely affected, sort of think of it as, you know, you're going through these added restrictions to home, maybe hopefully start saving lives because we're looking for ways to restrict the opiates that are truly causing a lot of problems, even, not, even if not for you. The other thing, though, that I would like to add, and this doesn't mean you will ever be one of those people, people don't have problems with opiates until they do. And I'm really glad you don't, and I hope that you never do, but I've worked with plenty of people that took opiates as prescribed and had no problems for years before that dependency for their pain issue became a very complex pain and addiction issue. And then we are now treating somebody who has a very difficult pain issue and the addiction. So how do you justify if the doctors don't want to deal with the addict because they're going to fail a screening? Um, it's a very difficult situation because, number one, we have so few primary care doctors up in our area to begin with. Number two, many doctors do not feel comfortable treating people with opioid dependency. If somebody is in a practice and they abuse their treatment, they may be discharged from that practice mm -hmm. and find it very difficult to get in another practice. So, so what do we do? I mean, number one, see if that individual is eligible for some type of insurance, 
either through Medicaid or through the New York State Health Exchange Program because that person needs insurance. Number two, the County Medical Society may be able to provide names of individuals who would be willing to see this individual. Number three, if it's a dependency problem, we will do whatever we can at Farnham to help them. That's all I can regularly recommend. Any other options? I mean, that's tough. No, I was looking to you to answer that one. But those would be my recommendations. Find insurance, call the County Medical Society, and if it's opioid dependency, we'll do what we can at Farnham and Farnham to help them. Any other questions by anybody? Yes, ma'am. You're talking about the program being opened up at Farnham and at Swiddle, which is wonderful, <clears throat> but there's many, many addicts out there and lots and lots of treatment needed. How many openings do you have? How hard is it? Do you have a way to what a great question. You know, I would add that, you know, I want to give some respect or, or, you know, acknowledge that other programs have opened up too since then. Syracuse Behavior Health opened one in Syracuse. Conifer Park opened one in Liverpool. Cradle opened one in Watertown. Beacon opened one in Rome. Uh, Central New York Services is getting ready to open one in Utica. And these places all seem pretty far away, but the truth is, is all of those places, patients were going all the way to Syracuse to go to Krause for, and now there's all these different places. Um, so we are spreading out and there's more programs opening up trying to help. Um, we've admitted 77 patients so far uh, since we opened. We opened September 11th. We medicated our first patient on, uh, we admitted our first patient on September 14th and we've admitted 77 since then. Right now, um, a person, if they called us, they could be scheduled I believe last I checked, you know, we, we scheduled somebody next week who called us today. Um, you know, we don't have a same day service right now, but that is pretty darn good. We do not have a waiting list. We are already planning um, and, you know, w what can we do next? What is our next, because uh, we're at 77, our capacity was, well, we're at 66 right now. We've admitted 77, but there have been some discharges. You know, if we reach 100, what's going to be our next strategy? Because that's our capacity right now. So we're already talking about ways that we could uh, either have that capacity restriction lifted or uh, have a file for an increase in capacity if needed. So we are trying to plan ahead. Right now, we do not have a waiting list. It's been a nice steady flow, which is it's good. There's a balance. Um, that's, that's the best I can tell you for right now. We, we have admitted three pregnant women, and we've admitted eight people who were traveling to Syracuse as transfers to our program, too, which might not sound like huge numbers, but that's also a really good thing. It's a great question, and the simple answer is the no, the program is not for somebody like you right now. It's for people who have addiction issues, not uh, pain management without any signs of abuse. One of the reasons is that we can only, you know, methadone for addiction only needs to be prescribed once per day because it's a longer acting opiate. Um, methadone for pain is actually issued several times for the day because it's only effective for pain at the peak of its dose, which is, I believe, around four hours, four to six hours. So we would not be able to adequately treat your pain um, in a one-time per day dosing program. I think if you wanted to try to withdraw from opiate narcotic medication for pain, you, and there is no issues, you'd want to work with your physician, and you know maybe one of the doctors could speak to that better than I could, uh, and then just be really careful for any signs of discomfort or misuse or uh, debilitation that is too depressing. I don't know if. Any other comments, questions? Okay, just as a final comment that I'd like to make, in any epidemic, there are two basic principles. Number one, you isolate and you treat all those individuals that are affected because that's how you stop an epidemic. And that's what we're trying to do is provide treatment for those individuals who have an abuse disorder at this point. 
The next step is we need to stop that next generation from starting on opiates. That's the next step. And this is where you folks can help because we need to educate those individuals as teens, just as Jamie said. That's how they get started, as teens. And I'll make a little plug that the county legislature has talked about funding additional education programs for the schools in Oswego County. We think at Farnham this would be a great help because preventing the next generation from individuals to starting an opiates is the way to stop this epidemic. So whatever you folks can do to talk to your legislators, recommend additional funding for education in the schools, we think that's the next step. Thank you very much again for coming. We appreciate it.